There we go. Welcome, everyone. Um, we're really, really pleased to bring you this webinar about medical cannabis and hopefully answer some of your questions and concerns that you have around this topic. And um, just before I do that, um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Heather Devine, uh, CEO of People and Pain Network. I co-lead and lead some of our pain self-management groups that are uh, now over 20 across BC. And I am just going to touch on some webinar etiquette, just uh, if there's some folks here that are not uh, as used to do, uh, attending webinars. Uh, with a large number of attendees to keep noise and sound reverberations, uh, you'll be in listen mode only, but there will be a chat box on your uh, rectangle that you see on your screen where you can type in any questions and towards the end of the presentation we'll have lots of time for the questions and answers and um, all you need to do is type those in. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, and you'll receive an email to let you know that it is now available and you can go back and watch it again um, and listen to anything that you weren't sure of and, um, and it will be there for you. So I want to take just a couple minutes before I introduce uh, Philippe from Tilray Til to uh, tell you a little bit about People Pay Network. We were founded in 2011 to provide uh, peer-led pain self-management groups, um, which is a place where there be ongoing support, education, and a connection to solutions and resources that are in your individual communities. We want it to be a safe place where people uh, can share the struggles, solutions, uh, successes with others who understand. Pain is invisible, and it's really important that we have the opportunity to talk with and share with other people who are living with pain. And it's a place where you can start to build a new normal, where you can just make enough space to look at what's important to you and what you want to add it back into your life that's important to you. Our groups, um, they're free and they're ongoing. Our groups have guidelines, we set agendas, uh, we have a format uh, which includes a short meditation. Many of you are just starting to do that at the beginning of the meeting just to help you check in uh, to the meeting and check out of the outside world and uh, to be more present for, for your care. This is about you. We have a check-in which you can talk about how your month was and there you can share struggles or, or successes, whatever is the most important to you on the day. We always have an educational segment and it's based on the needs of the members so the, the peer leader would would ask the members like what, what is it that you want to know more about and she could bring speakers in from the community or uh, use some of our recorded resources that are there for all of our members to use. And then towards the end we have a checkout which is about how, what did you hear today that's helpful, is, was there something that really stuck out for you. And then we try to end our meetings with a short guided meditation, five to ten minutes is all we're talking just to help people get into the habit of, of using calm breath and um, ways to calm down the nervous system which is always revved up because of pain. And our peer leaders are people living with pain. They go through an interview and orientation program so that we give them the, the most tools we can to make their role as a facilitator effective for you. Um, they're trained in brief action planning that's taught by the CCMI which stands for the Center for Collaboration, Motivation and Innovation and they teach brief action planning and motivational interviewing to doctors and nurses and caregivers and family members and all of our peer leaders. Um, and it's a wonderful way that we can help you take steps that you're not sure that you can do as you're building your new normal and adding pain self-management skills into your, uh, into your life. The meetings are monthly um, and our focus is on meeting the needs of the members and so again you will be asked what is important to you and what would you like to have in the meetings. Benefits of our meetings, it breaks isolation, so many people living with pain become really isolated. They, they realize when they come that they're not alone with some of their thoughts and feelings and emotions and I've been doing this for 26 years now and I hear that over and over again that it's so nice to feel that you're not alone with some of the some of the struggles. You get to meet others who understand what pain, uh, living with pain is like. We focus on, on adding back joy and laughter and meaning and purpose. Uh, you'll learn more about pain self-management tools that are important to you and again it's a safe place for you to build a new normal. So just a little bit about our resources. Our website is um, where we have a huge amount of resources that have been collected over the years. Um, 
you can go to our website at pipain.com to find a pain self-management group in your area. Um, we have over 60 recorded presentations and webinars and pain education and self-management videos and YouTubes, plus links to other organizations and communities. <coughs> So our website is a real good go-to place if you're looking for help with pain and pain self-management. We get asked what makes us special and why are we unique. So I just want to tell you really briefly, we are the only organization offering unlimited uh, uh, sorry, live face-to-face -face meetings and they're ongoing. Um, the UVIC program, which is an incredibly good program with information about pain self-management skills and tools. It's a limited six-week program, and when you finish that, you're disconnected from the help and support from there. So our groups are another place that you can come and keep on practicing and learning more about those pain self-management tools. The educational segments of our meetings are, again, governed by the needs of the group members. And family and friends and other support people are welcome to attend. We also provide education and support and events for families and friends of people living with pain. Uh, people in Pain no Network, I just want to add this little um, clarification. We don't recommend any type of therapy, medication, or pain management options. But what we do provide and what we do believe in is getting information to you about all the possible options so that you, maybe along with your healthcare provider, can make informed decisions about what is best for you. So our cannabis information webinar is becoming an important option for the management of several medical conditions uh, and especially for managing persistent pain. And our members have expressed many questions and concerns about uh, medical cannabis, especially about the legality of using this medication and medically prescribed cannabis. So today we're incredibly pleased and um, honored to have Philippe Lucas from Tilray come and talk to us and provide information and to answer some of your questions and concerns. He came to our Port Alberni group and I learned so much that I said, you know, there's got to be a way that we can get this wonderful information to more of our group's members and to some of the public as well. And so here we are. So um, welcome, Philippe, and uh, Dick will turn uh, the presenting mode over to you and take it away. Well, <clears throat> Thank you so much. Let me get my screen going. I think, uh, can you guys see my uh, my slide now? He Heather, can you guys see the slide now? Um, I can see it, but I think I had it already. I so, um, Dick, you might need to help us out with that. I can see it. Okay, perfect. I think we're all set then. Thank you so much, Heather, uh, and uh, people in pain for this uh, for this opportunity. Um, as Heather said, I had a chance over the last couple of months to to go up to Port Alberni and present to um, the Port Al Alberni chapter of People in Pain, and uh, was really excited by um, uh, by the questions and the curiosity that people had, and also the stories they were willing to share in terms of their own personal experiences of using uh, medical cannabis cannabis as a uh, as a either uh, an, an additional option or as a primary option for the treatment of of chronic pain uh, just a bit of background on myself I'm a I'm vice president of patient research and advocacy here at Tilray so I put a patient centered lens on our policies and practices and help oversee some of our clinical and observational uh, research uh, projects here including a phase two clinical trial on, on medical cannabis and PTSD that I'll tell you a bit more about um, in my presentation. I'm also a, um, a graduate scholar with the Center for Addictions uh, Research of British Columbia out of the University of Victoria and I really came about medical cannabis uh, initially as a patient. I started using medical cannabis in 1995. I had trouble finding a safe consistent supply of medical cannabis and so I, um, in 1999, I started one of Canada, Canada's first uh, nonprofit medical cannabis dispensaries, the Vancouver Island Compassion Society. I ran that organization from 1999 to 2009, and uh, I served a term at, on city council in Victoria from 2008 to 2011. 
Um, at which point, uh, a few years later, I began my work here at Tilray, and I've been working here at Tilray since February of 2014 in an effort to provide the uh, best source of medical cannabis to patients and the uh, the greatest uh, and, and uh, most reliable customer service for uh, uh, Canada's critically and chronically ill patients. So <clears throat> today, as part of my presentation, I'm going to look at a brief history of the medical marijuana program in Canada so that uh, everyone can understand where we started um, and how we got where we are today. I'm then going to uh, provide a brief overview of Tilray and uh, with a focus on some of our current research uh, initiatives as well as our research findings. Um, after which I'm going to uh, show a video of one of our first patients so you can track her story a little bit and uh, and then I'm, I'm happy to take some questions as well. So um, let's get things going. So the federal medical marijuana program in Canada didn't start because uh, any of our major uh, federal parties decided they wanted to do something compassionate for Canadians or because they wanted to take a, a leadership role internationally uh, for Canada in terms of medical cannabis access. It really started, uh, unfortunately, on the backs of, of patients um, who were being um, uh, targeted by police for their use of medical cannabis. The two patients in, that, that, um, that really led to our current program are um, uh, Jim Wakeford, a gentleman who was affected by uh, HIV AIDS in BC, and Terry Parker, a gentleman uh, affected by MS uh, living in Ontario. And <clears throat> Both those patients were finding that either themselves or their providers of medical cannabis were, were running into legal obstacles to, uh, to accessing medical cannabis. And through a series of court decisions in the late 90s, they ended up before the uh, Supreme Court of Canada, which ultimately found in 2000 that Canadians have a constitutional right to access cannabis as a medicine. And in fact, um, the entire foundation of our Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, which governs um, the prohibition of uh, illicit substances in Canada, is dependent, the constitutionality of that program is dependent on Canada having a working and effective medical cannabis program. Um, this program has gone through uh, some challenges since it was established in 2001. Um, in response to the court decision uh, that, I, that I just cited, Health Canada started the medical marijuana access regulations in 2001. It, initially, it was a very onerous program. It, uh, it included a 33-page application form. Initially, you had to see one at, at sometimes two physicians and maybe a specialist on top of that in order to be able to get access to medical cannabis. They would help you fill out that 33-page application, which you would then send to Health Canada that would take anywhere from six weeks to six months to process it. So we saw a significant amount of bureaucratic obstacles to access and on a more practical basis for those patients who found themselves in a terminally ill situation, because of the long processing time of this program, it meant that there was virtually no legal access to medical cannabis available for them in their end of life care. So. Um, we uh, a few years ago, Health Canada began began to uh, consider how to uh, change this program after the program was found unconstitutional uh, at least ten times over its first ten years of operation, and that's um, how we started looking at other options to the MMAR. Um, Currently, there's about 54,000 Canadians who are part of the federal medical marijuana program, um, and it is growing in leaps and bounds these days in terms of patient numbers and physicians who are sending patients through that program. But it is worth noting that um, research suggests that there's somewhere between 400,000 and a million Canadians currently claiming to use cannabis for medical purposes, and so that's about two to four percent of the adult population in Canada, and that is a similar number that we'd see in uh, U.S. medical marijuana states like Washington, Colorado, Oregon, et cetera, um, and uh, California. So about 2 to 4 percent of the adult population is what we can presume is the uh, average pace of use for medical cannabis. And what that means, unfortunately, is if there's a million Canadians who are currently uh, claiming to use medical cannabis and only 50,000 in the federal program right now, the overwhelming majority of medical cannabis patients in Canada are not protected from arrest and prosecution as it stands. So in uh, March 31st of 2014, after extensive consultation with um, uh, 
key uh, uh, with key stakeholders, including municipalities, police, fire, um, as well as uh, some patient groups. Health Canada ended the old MMAR program and replaced it with the uh, the MMPR program, the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations, um, and that's what started in April 2014, and it brought about some significant changes uh, to the medical marijuana program compared to the old system. Under the new system, um, the uh, we have a much simplified uh, decentralized application process. So unlike the old 33-page application, it could take five to six weeks to, uh, uh, or, or, or six weeks, I should say, to, uh, to six months to process by Health Canada. Under the new system, you can go uh, to the website of a company like Tilray, or one of about 35 licensed producers, print out an application form, bring that to your doctor. It's a single page document they fill out the application form and you actually leave the doctor's office being a legal medical cannabis user so there's no wait times anymore and there's no onerous large-scale application process additionally under the new system nurse practitioners theoretically can prescribe cannabis and I say theoretically because there isn't a province yet that has allowed those nurse practitioners to do so but <clears throat> they are noted as part of the MMPR as being able to recommend medical cannabis legally. Under the new system, we have multiple licensed producers, and that's quite a shift from the old system. Under the MMAR, we had a single licensed producer producing a single strain of cannabis and making that legally available to Canadians. And that product proved to be uh, so unpopular uh, because of quality concerns as well as the, the general lack of selection that fewer than 10% of patients who were part of the initial uh, MMAR program actually access that cannabis strain despite it being uh, subsidized in terms of cost by Health Canada. So it was actually $5 a gram under that the old system, but it was w widely uh, rejected by patients. So under the new system, you've got uh, multiple licensed producers. Uh, at last count, it was over 35 licensed producers in Canada mostly concentrated in Ontario and BC and those producers produce hundreds of different strains as well as uh, dozens of extract products um, all of which are available at, at many different price points. Under the new system you've got significantly increased quality control you've got um, licensed producers like Tilray have to test cannabis for uh, biological impurities like mold and mildews. We have to uh, certify that it's pesticide free. We've got to uh, ensure that it's uh, uh, that the uh, that there's no heavy metals in terms of uh, levels of concern for heavy metals. And we also label it for THC and CBD. <coughs> and in fact, at Tilray, uh, beyond that, we we also test cannabis for uh, about a dozen cannabinoids and over 20 terpenes, and we make that some of that data available to our patients and to physicians uh, through our website so that patients and physicians can get a better sense of what it is that they're using in terms of the medical use of cannabis. But, uh, but we do label it as per regulations for uh, the THC levels. THC is the main psychoactive chemical in the cannabis plant, and uh, for CBD, which is uh, cannabidiol, and CBD is a non-psychoactive uh, component of the cannabis plant, and you might have heard of it because it's it's been used and touted um, as an effective means of controlling seizures in uh, pediatric patients with, uh, with severe and, and specialized types of epilepsy. Uh, on top of that, we also see under the new system that we have significantly increased strain symptom awareness because licensed producers like Tilray are really motivated to be able to look at patient patterns of use, which is the kind of research that I do uh, currently, and to examine uh, whether or not, for example, there's strain symptom correlations, whether patients suffering uh, for chronic, with chronic pain or with arthritis tend to favor specific strains or methods of ingestion or patterns of use. So we have much more information on how medical cannabis patients are using cannabis than we ever have before. <laughs> Uh, as I said, uh, there's about 35 licensed producers here in Canada, and uh, here's a, a list of all of them. You can find this list on the Health Canada website if you uh, uh, want to research a little bit about what your options are as a patient. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Tilray, um, just so you get a sense of the size, scope, and, um, and um, the general um, policies and procedures that, that licensed producers in Canada have in place. So at Tilray, we began operations in April of 2014. Um, we operate in a 60,000 square foot, $30 million high-tech medical cannabis production facility located in uh, Nanaimo, BC. <coughs> 
And we've currently got uh, uh, about 140 full-time staff here. We're the sixth biggest employer here, in, uh, private employer here in Nanaimo. And in fact, in our first year of operation, we received a um, uh, an award from the Chamber of Commerce as the best new business in uh, the Nanaimo region. We have a great relationship with Maryland Council, and uh, and that's one of the reasons we established ourselves here in Nanaimo because we found a Maryland Council in a uh, in a municipality that was really welcoming to this kind of um, <clears throat> <clears throat> this kind of um, high-tech production uh, facility and um, it's just been a great relationship with the community and, and of course we've created a lot of great jobs here in the region as well as ancillary ta tax benefits for the uh, for the region so at Tilray um, we grow clones using cloner propagation and so what you can see right now is that we keep mothers our, our mother room is basically our, our genetic bank where we keep strains uh, we keep uh, mother plants for our 55 strains at Tilray we've got the largest uh, selection of strains available in Canada the uh, largest selection of high THC strains as well and the highest selection of high CBD strains we've also got the greatest selection of extract products in Canada so here you can see some of our staff who are tending to our mothers and then they're taking clones rooting those clones in a pre-veg area before they go into our grow room where we flower them out um, using 18 hours of light and exposing those plants to uh, to that light for anywhere from eight weeks to uh, 12 or 13 weeks depending on on the strain um, we've got a, a trim room and so we uh, we uh, uh, make sure that all of our products get a, a final inspection by the trim team to make sure that that, that serves kind of as a quality control measure as well uh, it then gets tested by the lab for heavy metals and uh, as well as for our cannabinoid profiles and um, and we actually use a third-party lab for biological testing. It then goes into our packaging room, and our packaging is uh, a tamper evident. That's a silver seal that you would see right over here, and it's also um, uh, a, a child resistant as well to make sh make sure that uh, only the patients are supposed to get into this product. And uh, the last picture you see is our secure uh, product storage, which it is in our vault, and. Um, here at Tilray, we've got 24-hour, seven-day-a-week on-site security as well. So this is a very secure product. Um, more recently, we've added an extraction laboratory, and what you're looking at right now is a CO2 extraction machine. Um, we use um, our extraction laboratory to produce our extract products, and right now our extracts available for patients in Canada are five different um, oil extract products. Um, we have those oil extracts available at Indica, Sativa, Hybrid, as well as uh, two different CBD preparations. And extract products are great for people who don't want to smoke or vaporize their cannabis. You might want to see a bit more um, consistency from batch to batch and use to use than you might get from smoked or vaporized cannabis. And, um, and at this, in this laboratory as well, we're producing extract products for clinical research, um, not just in Canada, but internationally. So I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, further down the presentation. So ultimately, um, really, the goal of Tilray, one of our primary goals, is to be as patient-centered as possible. And that's where some of the work that I do as a, as a former patient, as a long-term patient advocate, uh, I say former patient, as someone who started out as a patient, continues as a patient here in Canada, but also as a patient advocate, <coughs> That's really where we focus a lot of our work. So um, in terms of patient-centered practices, we're one of only two licensed producers in Canada that have a 24-7 uh, helpline available for patients. If you call 1-844-TILRAY-1 or 1-844-845-7291, um, you'll be able to reach um, uh, someone here at Tilray. Uh, and if you end up uh, having to leave a message, we'll get back to you. We aim to get back to you within 24 hours. Um, additionally, anyone looking for additional information on Tilray can go right to tilray.ca. But, um, but really being able to access and, and provide answers to questions on different strains that might be effective, different methods of ingestion, or otherwise on how to navigate the MMPR, how to get, uh, how to talk to your doctor about medical cannabis. These are all things that our, our Tilray uh, staff is really well geared uh, in terms of answering any of the questions that you might have. Additionally, as part of our uh, patient-centered practices, we have a program called the Tilray Assurance Program. It provides low-income discounts ranging from 10% to 25% for low-income patients of Tilray's. <coughs> we also have a, an across-the-board 
a seniors discount of 10% for patients over uh, 65 years old. And we provide a $50 credit uh, for Tilray right at registration so that you can try Tilray products at no risk uh, to yourself to see if medical cannabis is a, a good option for you uh, ultimately. Um, we also have um, a great um, a shipping policy and for those who may not be familiar with the MMPR, um, we're not allowed to sell cannabis through storefronts. Um, we ship it directly to patients, directly to their door, which is a nice convenient mode of access and at Tilray we ship cannabis within 48 hours to uh, uh, patients uh, all across Canada for five dollars per shipment. So it's also a very cost-effective means of getting access to medical cannabis. Um, additionally, as part of our uh, patient-centered strategies, we're currently lobbying to get medical cannabis um, uh, recognized as being tax-free. So um, that's called zero-rating cannabis in terms of medical use. We think that it should be <coughs> tax-free like any other uh, prescription drugs and we're also uh, have been lobbying um, both through Tilray and through the Canadian Medical Cannabis Council which is an industry association, a uh, national industry association for licensed producers I'm currently executive director of. We've been lobbying for uh, private and provincial insurance coverage for medical cannabis because we honestly don't think that, that um, cost should be an obstacle to access to patients. Um, I also just want to take a quick minute to introduce you to Maria. She was our first patient. She's a former RCMP officer who injured her her hand in uh, the course of duty and she'd lost 60% of the function of her left hand before trying medical cannabis and um, I'm going to be showing you a video at the end of this uh, presentation that takes you through a bit of Maria's journey uh, through uh, and, you, and her use of medical cannabis to treat both chronic pain as well as, as uh, some of the symptoms of PTSD. As I suggested, um, we're not allowed to provide cannabis through storefronts, and so at Tilray, all of our patients order their cannabis by either calling our 24-hour helpline and placing an order with our, our, our uh, customer service staff, or they order it online by simply placing an online order as you would with Amazon or any other online provider to be able to purchase a product. Um, so that's what, right now, this is what our our website looks like at uh, www.tilray.ca and you'll also note in the corner Elwin. Um, Elwin is a very popular strain for daytime use and also for pediatric patients because it's our highest CBD strain and it has three times more CBD than it does THC so it provides relief of chronic pain and inflammation <laughs> as well as relief and seizure disorders without uh, some of the um, uh, intoxication you might get from THC. I mentioned our extract products. This is a, a selection of extract products that Tilray is currently working on and developing. And as it stands right now, we've got our Indica drops, or, or, or I should say our Tilray drops, available in five different preparations. And the next products we're going to be releasing are going to be our liquid caps. Um, and uh, we're also looking to develop uh, uh, and have developed, and we're just waiting for proper approvals on all these products from Health Canada for our topical oil. Um, and and uh, we're also hoping to have an ormucosal spray as well as a, uh, a CBD vape, uh, vaporizer cartridge as well over the, uh, over the next few years uh, available over the, uh, or I should say over the coming months and over the coming years. So I want to tell you a little bit about our research at Tilray. Um, we've been involved in medical cannabis research now and have really taken a lead in Canada uh, in terms of medical cannabis research. We've got um, a clinical research project that's going to be uh, launching in the next few weeks. We're going to start recruiting uh, patients in the next few weeks. It's a phase two placebo placebo-controlled clinical trial of medical cannabis and PTSD. Tilray is fully sponsoring that trial, which is taking place at UBC Okanagan. And um, it's going to involve 42 participants, about half of which will be military or police veterans, and the other half will be survivors of uh, uh, sexual or other violence. The study is going to compare three preparations of uh, cannabis, a high THC, um, a THC-CBD combination. We're going to be comparing that to placebo. So we're uh, really looking forward to getting that off the ground. We're also um, currently involved in studies for, of adult epilepsy with the uh, Ontario Brain Institute. And we've provided extract product um, for a, um, a, a study of the side oncological treatment in, uh, that's taking place at New South Wales. <coughs> and we're doing that in cooperation with the government of New South Wales. And um, 
Uh, on top of that, we've got a, 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 a Tilray observational patient survey that I'm currently in charge of. It's a multi-site study looking at the impacts of medical cannabis on uh, quality of life and on prescription drug use over a 12-month period. It's taking place at 20 medical sites and we're cur currently recruiting patients at about 11 sites right now to take part in that study. And This, this is a study that's taking place all over Canada and we're really hoping it's going to provide data that will be helpful in uh, getting insurers to consider covering the cost of medical cannabis as well as providing us with information on how patients are using medical cannabis right now and its impact. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about what we know about medical cannabis patients in Canada, um, just so you get a sense of, uh, of who, who, who are Canadian patients right now. So last year we did a uh, survey of Tilray patients. It was a 107 question survey we made available for a two week period. And um, it went through uh, ethics review and we got 301 responses to that survey. So I'm going to tell you what we found out. We found out that um, most of the patients who responded to the survey are male. We see 73% male versus 27% female. Um, that's actually representative of the general Canadian uh, medical cannabis patient population. We tend to see more men than women using medical cannabis, although that is starting to shift now with a greater, um, I think, accessibility and, and a lower level of stigma associated with medical cannabis use that, that comes with its legitimization. We see that in terms of first medical use, patients um, on average used it for the first time at, at age 34, and that the average age of use of our Tilray patients who responded to the survey is at 40 years old, and that's very close to the average age we see of Tilray patients in general, which is around 42 years old. And the reason I think that's interesting is that it seems to, to fly in the face a little bit of the, some of the public perception of medical cannabis patients out there, that it's all just young men using the system in order to try and get access to a legal source of cannabis. We see overwhelmingly that medical cannabis patients in Canada are older patients uh, or middle-aged patients and that, that's, uh, uh, that's really interesting to know. On average, about 71% of Tilray patients use two grams or less per day. So there are some significant outliers for that in terms of how much patients use and we do see some patients that use seven grams or more but that's only about two percent of the population. Overwhelmingly um, it's about, uh, uh, well as I said, 71 percent use two grams or less and that's in keeping with other research done in Canada, US and internationally that suggests most cannabis patients use between 0.5 and 1.5 grams per day. This, is, this was a fascinating result for me as someone who's been um, doing patient surveys for a long time because it's the first survey that I'm aware of that showed that vaporization, which is a non-smoke form of ingestion for cannabis with a lot of the benefits of smoking in terms of the, the rapid onset of effect, um, that vaporization was the primary method of ingestion cited by our patients and in fact, if you go to uh, vaporization, look at vaporization and then edibles and add those together, you see that it's over 50% of patients who responded to the survey that are no longer smoking as their primary method of ingestion. And when we ask patients about their preferred method of ingestion, we see vaporization followed by oral ingestion, so edibles and, and extracts, and that's followed by joints, water pipes, and, uh, and pipes. So. <clears throat> I think this really signifies a health conscious shift in patients away from smoking of medical cannabis and towards the vaporization of cannabis. And that's a very positive shift for, uh, for patients in general. Um, when we ask patients to primary illness, they had to click one uh, primary illness, but then we also asked them about their primary symptoms, at which point they could click a number of different symptoms they use medical cannabis for. And this was what we found, it was quite fascinating. We do find that the primary illness reported by patients is either chronic pain or arthritis. Together that made up 48% of responses, so almost half of our patients are citing uh, uh, chronic pain issues as a reason for using medical cannabis. It was the next three that were really interesting as well because when you add up psychiatric disorder, PTSD and insomnia, you really see that medical cannabis is being used in Canada right now for the treatment of pain and mental health conditions. And that's corroborated by the, the primary symptoms. We see chronic pain is cited by, as the number one reason patients use medical cannabis. It's cited by 73% of participants. 
but we also see uh, stress, insomnia, and depression as the next three reasons why patients are using chronic pain. And it may not be a surprise that when we ask patients about their prescription, about um, substitution of medical cannabis, which is an area of research that I, my particular research focuses on, um, that, that they cited a high rate of substitution for prescription drugs, but also for alcohol, cigarettes, tobacco, and illicit drugs. Now, just to let you know what, what cannabis substitution is all about, that's when patients or even recreational users of cannabis consciously and subconsciously use cannabis instead of another substance. And in this case, we're really interested in the use of cannabis as a substitute for prescription drugs. And so we asked them to list the prescription drugs they were using medical cannabis instead of. And I guess it's probably no surprise to the people on, uh, who are watching this today, sufferers of chronic pain, that the primary classes of drugs we're seeing substitution for are pharmaceutical <coughs> opioids. You see uh, oxyoxyneopercocet, and then codeine derivatives, and then um, hydromorphone, morphine, and then even other opiates listed down below. So overall, you see that um, well over 30% of patients um, or, or of substitution that's going on is for prescription opioids. I was also fascinated to see once again that we see antidepressants and benzodiazepines both used to treat mental health and also to help chronic pain patients sleep in terms of benzodiazepines <coughs> cited amongst the, the many drugs that patients use cannabis instead of. So in light of the rising rates of opioid addiction and mortality and mor morbidity in Canada, the U.S. and internationally, um, we certainly do think that, that medical cannabis can provide a potential solution or an extra tool in the tool belt for physicians who'd like to get their patients using fewer opioids or to quit opioids altogether. So now I'm going to show you a clip from Maria's story and then I really look forward to taking your questions. This is part of 300 morphine tablets per month. Two bottles of nortriptyline. Try and break the chronic sleep pattern. <clears throat> All of these combined uh, have about 23 side effects to me. It's a part-time job managing <clears throat> chronic pain. The other part-time job is managing the side effects <clears throat> of this stuff. I, I, I want my life back. I want to have my quality of life returned. There is no, no place that it's not painful. A lot of things were affected by, by the injury. I had to go through a grieving process of uh, really dealing with the emotional impact. It was very, very hard. In the beginning of taking morphine, the side effects weren't quite so bad. It, it seemed to get worse. Narcotics was altering my reality. It was altering everything about me. I really had to put myself through a process of reevaluating my own values when it comes to cannabis. For me, it, it was then agreeing with my doctors who had made the suggestion before I was ready to try this. And then to actually see what happened when we tried it on four different occasions. Um, to see actually small amounts kill the pain, stop the rain outs, and I'm not high, I'm not out there, I've got no side effects, and I have four hours where I have no pain. Life has returned to somewhat normal. By day three, my body actually felt like mine. I had no more cramps in my legs. Um, I wasn't feeling unwell. I was actually feeling well. By day eight, um, I was completely off morphine. What's changed is my mind is clear. There's no overlay, that fog of morphine. I can multitask like I used to. I'm back able to be really clear in conversations, not nauseated, um, not indigestion, not feeling unwell. All of that's dissipated, so I'm back to what you would call myself. My quality of life was destroyed, and now I have it back. <laughs> so 
so Maria is a really uh, remarkable human being. I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, we remain good friends, and she's. Uh, we're trying to find a time for her to teach my seven-year-old how to fish. Although, at the end of that video, you you saw that uh, uh, maybe she. I hope she has more luck when she's teaching my daughter how to fish than she did on that that particular day. Um, I really, uh, I, I, you know, the thing that I always remember with Maria is that a former RP, RCMP officer, she really had to go through a, a, a deep look inside before she decided that medical cannabis was going to be something that she would consider using. And, and so I hope that, uh, that her story resounds with uh, other sufferers of chronic pain there as you consider what your treatment options are. Um, I think that the, the thing that I always keep in mind with medical cannabis is um, that um, it, it it, it doesn't work for everyone, there's no doubt about that, but for those patients it does work, it really does make a difference in their overall quality of life and um, and because it's not as um, as onerous or potentially dangerous a lot of well, prescription drugs, it is very easy to be able to try this product, to try it legally and to be able to see if it works or it's effective for uh, uh, for for you as well and, and with uh, credit programs like Tilray providing a $50 registration credit, you can also uh, try it at, at very little or no impact to you financially. So now I'd be more than happy to uh, to take some questions and I do want to say if you want to to get access or to more information from Tilray, you can certainly go to www.tilray.ca. We have a lot of information for patients and physicians on the website. Um, you can also call us 24-7 uh, at one eight four four 844 tilray one which is 845-7291, and I've got my website, uh, my own uh, personal web address at Tilray on the screen right now if you want to get a hold of me. So I'll turn it over to Heather to see if she's got some questions coming in at all. Hi, I do have a couple questions that have been typed in. Um, uh, there's a person who's been using CBD for pain management at trigeminal neuralgia, and he has a few questions that I hope you might address. Um, the first one is, what does your research show CBD does for pain, and what doses of CBD in milligrams do you feel might be most effective? Uh, it's a great question. Um, there, the current research suggests that the addition of CBD, particularly in, in addition to THC, um, helps mitigate pain. It seems to help mitigate pain in a, in a way that's um, an add-on to THC, so it seems to be um, to be a work better in combination than either uh, substances used in isolation. Um, it also helps reduce inflammation. <clears throat> So both THC and CBD have anti-inflammatory qualities, and uh, that's one of the reasons, of course, with so many pain conditions being inflammatory conditions, that it can be very helpful in the treatment of chronic pain. In terms of doses, it's uh, um, it's very um, individualistic, and what we recommend is, of course, talk to your patient about what the right dose might be for you. We typically rec recommending a, a uh, go slow and uh, low approach, so start with a, a very low dose of cannabinoids and slowly increase your dose until you find the proper dosage window, which can best be described as, as finding effective relief for your symptoms without finding any of the uh, potential side effects that you might find unpleasant, such, such as dizziness, disorientation or anything to that effect. So definitely talk to your doctor in terms of dosing and, uh, and or once you join Tilray we'd be happy to talk to you about uh, you know specific strains or otherwise that might be most helpful um, in, in, that, in those considerations. We currently have five or six high CBD strains available in, in, at Tilray. Most of them are one to one strains and uh, we also have a three to one strain um, and by one to one I mean that they're equal parts THC and CBD and that's what most of our chronic pain patients are using but we also have a three to one CBD THC strain uh, that some uh, are using during daytime as well and, and, and those same um, measurements are, all, are also available in our extract products and more and more of our patients are are either using extracts uniquely or using extracts in combination with raw cannabis. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here. Uh, somebody is, was wondering if there are studies that found that medical cannabis is effective in reducing neuropathic pain, and so maybe by how much? 
Yeah, um, a lot of the research that's been done on cannabinoids and the treatment of pain has been done on neuropathic pain. Um, GW Pharmaceuticals, which has a, a cannabis extract product called Sativex available in Canada and internationally, did a lot of research on neuropathic pain associated with MS and in fact got that uh, product uh, um, uh, approved in the treatment of MS-related neuropathic pain and uh, as well as uh, um, HIV AIDS-related pain, I believe, as well. So um, cannabinoids are very effective in the treatment of neuropathic pain in a way that opioids have proven not to be very effective uh, because of the uh, uh, the chemical pathways associated with the, with that pain and with the treatment of that pain. And so. If you're finding poor relief using traditional opioids or prescription drugs, uh, certainly cannabinoids might provide a solution for you. Sorry, could you repeat the second part of that uh, that question, Heather? I thought that was the second part as well. Oh, sure. Um, oh, I just find the right question here. Huh. <laughs> uh, by how much you wanted to know. Um, is it oh, in terms of log drops, it's, yeah. it's once again seems to be very dependent, and that's some of the research that we're doing is to try and get a uh, get a sense of what kind of log drop we'd see or what kind of percentage drop we'd see in chronic pain. Um, there's a very good study uh, done in Canada by Mark Ware that looked at the treatment of of chronic pain using medical cannabis and if you want to reach out to me I'd be happy to share the results of that study um, which gives a more detailed uh, account of um, specifically the amount of pain relief that patients had found using uh, he used uh, uh, VAS as our visual assessment scales to assess the levels of pain before and after the cannabis use um, and he had a placebo in there as well so we could compare it to placebo. Great. I know Mark Ware has been doing a huge amount of research in the use of medical cannabis over the last couple of decades. So that's right. Um, lots of good reports there. Um, I have an interesting question from a recent pharmacy graduate working in Victoria. Uh, he asked, "Can his patients access the Tilray cannabis here, obviously in Victoria? And if not, what resources can he pass on to his patients?" Uh, patients all over Canada can access Tilray Cannabis. They uh, they sign up with Tilray and then we ship it directly to their door. Um, there's no legal license source of cannabis currently available through any of the storefronts or dispensaries anywhere in Canada. Um, those storefronts uh, storefronts were not uh, and dispensaries were not regulated under the old MMER. They're currently not regulated under the the MMPR. And although some municipalities have moved forward to regulate um, those storefronts, including Victoria, they do not source cannabis from licensed producers or from a, a currently uh, a legal source in Canada. So. Um, so patients who are looking to access Tilray cannabis will have to sign up directly with Tilray and have it shipped to their door uh, via courier or otherwise. I should mention one more thing. Um, so under the new system, dis, uh, as I mentioned, dispensaries are not regulated, and there's there's and and that. Although I do think that in the future we will see some kind of a, a storefront access. I don't think there's anyone in the medical marijuana program that doesn't think that patients will be able to access it at some point or another through pharmacies or through other storefront outlets uh, in terms of legal legally accessing it. But I also want to mention that um, there's a, a that changes in the medical marijuana program continue to be made um, through the courts. And in August, by the end of August this year, Health Canada has to put in place um, a system again to allow patients to be able to produce their own cannabis um, within the privacy of their own homes. So over the next few weeks, um, listeners will be able to, uh, I'm, and I'm sure this is going to be in all the national news, will be able to find out um, how patients can grow cannabis again legally for their own personal use within the, the privacy of their own home. And and uh, so that's something to pay attention to uh, over the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> Thank you. There's another uh, question that's asked a couple of different times. Um, what happens if their doctor won't consider uh, a trial of, of cannabis? What can these people do? What a great question. Uh, Tilray works um, very hard at educating physicians on um, on how to work within the medical marijuana uh, regulations in Canada, as well as um, generally providing information on the latest research on therapeutic ap applications for cannabis. So we have a, a network of physicians that are uh, well-schooled and comfortable using cannabinoids and considering the use of, of medical cannabis for patients. So if you contact us um, through our 24-7 helpline, um, at uh, one eight four four Tilray one, 
or 845-7291, we'd be happy to try and find and help you find a physician in your area that might be more comfortable um, or more educated around the use of medical cannabis. Awesome. There's a couple of uh, people asking also about long-term side effects, particularly one lady about uh, it, does it does it be put out of the body through the kidneys? Is there any harm to kidneys with uh, using the medical cannabis? I am not aware, and 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 you know, our our governments in Canada and the U.S. have spent billions of dollars looking for potential harms associated with the medical use of cannabis. There's ongoing research um, at the population level looking at cannabis users, chronic and non-chronic users, um, in order to track potential harms and I've never been made aware of a specific harm associated uh, with kidneys. It's processed through the liver uh, largely and even there we haven't seen any uh, negative interactions with the liver to suggest um, uh, an increase in potential harms. Um, so no, I'm not aware of any problems um, with uh, kidney function associated with medical cannabis use. Great. Um, another question that's on our list here is cannabis thought to play a role in vascular function, especially helping with Renault's disease? Yes, uh, it's so funny that you mention that because Maria, if you go to our website, we've got uh, three versions of the Maria video. We have the first video that we shot, we have a, a second follow up video, and the video I showed today is a uh, <clears throat> an amalgamation of those two videos, kind of a compilation. Um, in the first video, um, Maria talks about the first time that she used medical cannabis and, and essentially she was at a, at a party and someone was passing around a joint and she had a chance to, someone said, you know, do you want to try this to see if it helps with your hand? And it, it took some soul searching to decide before she decided to do it, but she did. She took a puff and as she describes it, she watched her very white, um, you know, generally painful, numb hand. She watched the color rise back into her hand and she suddenly had mobility without pain in her hand uh, to the extent that she hadn't had in, in months, if not years. And, uh, and so one of the main symptoms that she, was, she initially found was useful in terms of the use of cannabis is treating her Renault's uh, syndrome. And we, we hear that often from patients. While it's not typically a, a primary reason for use with so many of our chronic pain patients, um, um, it ends up being one of the, uh, one of the pleasant um, uh, findings that they have in that their renos uh, tends to get better or at least um, not bother them as much. Great. Um, oh, I was reading questions here. I got lost in doing that. <laughs> um, actually, it seems there might be a physician here, or at least a question about it, and wanting to know uh, what are the main liabilities uh, for general physicians when prescribing marijuana for a patient. Well, um, in BC, there's um, guidelines on how physicians can go about and prescribe cannabis. Um, you know, they're, uh, they're actually, it's, it's interesting because BC recently came out with guidelines on how to prescribe opioids and the, the opioid prescription guidelines are more onerous than the medical cannabis prescription guidelines, which is actually um, nicely reflective of their potential harms because uh, opioids, of course, unfortunately will lead to, um, to a high number of uh, overdoses, hospitalizations, so more, the, the rate of morbidity and mortality in Canada associated with opioids is quite high. With medical cannabis, it's, it's, uh, certainly there's no mortality risk or issues. There's no way to OD on, on medical cannabis um, in terms of fatal overdoses and the level of morbidity is very small as well. So. <clears throat> Uh, if there's a physician who's listening to this, I, I recommend that you check your provincial regulations um, on how to prescribe medical cannabis. But in general, it's uh, it's very much in keeping with um, how you would prescribe all other drugs. In BC, I think that there's some additional requirements to be able to ensure that patients um, aren't at a risk for dependence issues associated with medical cannabis. But uh, but beyond that, because of the high safety profile associated with with medical cannabis use in general. Um, the regulations certainly aren't, aren't particularly onerous and as I suggested, if you want to recommend cannabis to a patient right now, uh, you simply have to, to fill out a one-page form similar to a traditional uh, prescription. The physician has to, the main decision the physician has to make has nothing to do with a method of ingestion or you know selecting a specific strain for a patient. It's simply to do with the amount of daily, um, uh, the amount that you, you would recommend your patient has access to on a daily basis. 
in, ter in terms of grams. And right now, the average prescription in Canada is about three grams per day in terms of patient access, although we know that most patients are, are only using about 0.5 to 1.5 grams per day. And as I showed in the slide, about 70% of Tilray patients use two grams or less per day. Great. Um, yeah, those new opioid guidelines um, that are just released can uh, maybe cause a few more problems, but uh, I just want to put in there really quickly, if anyone is having trouble with them, please contact PainBC. They are doing some great uh, work with fielding some of the concerns, so I'll just throw that in there for anybody that might want uh, some help with that. Um, a good question here is uh, somebody is considering a trial of the medical cannabis and they want to know if there's any odors that come with the capsules or any of the products. Uh, great question. Um, in, in terms of um, raw cannabis, of course, um, most people in BC would have uh, smelt raw cannabis in the past. Um, when, it's, when raw cannabis is burning, it does have a fairly strong, pungent, and recognizable smell. Um, raw cannabis, uh, our, our particular products come in a scent-proof pack so you don't have to worry about receiving anything near your door. It um, comes in a scent-proof pack, it's then vacuum sealed and it's sent in a very discreet um, box directly to your door. <coughs> Or you could pick it up at uh, at your uh, at uh, the closest um, uh, at the closest uh, post office as well, um, associated with our shipping uh, our shipping partners. The uh, uh, in terms of um, using cannabis in order to reduce the smell, a lot of patients find it more convenient and also less irritating the lungs to use vaporizers. Um, vaporizers push warm air through the cannabis plant without actually burning the cannabis, so it ends up being uh, uh, a much lower risk in terms of irritation and uh, and it produces far less smell and so it's much more discreet as well and it won't smell up your house and um, our extract products the oil products are while not scent free um, are very very lightly scented of cannabis and uh, and when they're sealed there should be no reason why anyone would uh, would be able to smell them they're very uh, they're very discreet and good for discreet use you can travel as a legal user you can and with product from a licensed producer like Tilray you can bring that product on a uh, on a flight with you within Canada. You cannot leave the country with any of these products because medical cannabis is not recogni recognized as a medicine in the same way in other jurisdictions as it is in Canada. But um, anywhere within Canada, you can legally travel with it. You can, you know, whether it be flying, driving, or anything across provinces, um, as long as you keep the packaging with you to be able to show or uh, or, or um, your proof of prescription that we sent with all of our packages as well, so you're able to show that you're using these products legally just as you would with any prescription drug where you've got the, uh, the packaging on the prescription drug showing that, that this is actually a prescription product for you. Great. Um, we have time just for one more question, um, and please remember if we haven't got your question, uh, Philippe has given you the, uh, his email there as well as you can call Tilray at any time with your questions. Um, as you mentioned, they have a 24-hour helpline there. Um, this question uh, may answer a few other questions. A person who's come from another province and has been uh, prescribed uh, medical cannabis, uh, she had to renew her prescription every three months uh, through a Medi Online uh, appointment. Mm. But she wants to know, can she s switch to another doctor here on the island? Um, can she print off the Tilray medical document and bring it to her doctor to sign? Or what is the process? Uh, I think that's a great question to end up on. Yeah, great question. Uh, absolutely, you, you, you can switch, and I suggest you do switch to a BC-based physician in order to to track and support um, your use of medical cannabis in order to track the rest of your condition as well. Um, yes, you can print out the, uh, the Tilray application and bring that to your physician. I would keep a copy of your old um, application process or at least some record that, that, that shows that you've been a, a legal medical cannabis user before. And <clears throat> There are a number of organizations uh, and physicians in BC who can uh, help you uh, get that prescription. But I would start with going, uh, I know I always recommend this to all patients, that so they initially talk to their GP about their medical use of cannabis. Um, even those patients who've approached me in the past and said, well, my GP's really conservative, he's an older general practice. Uh, I find that uh, 
at least 50% of physicians out there will prescribe cannabis for some patients under some circumstances, and that those who won't prescribe will, may still support the use of a patient um, uh, as long as it's prescribed by another physician. So they may not feel the level of comfort or knowledge or understanding of medical cannabis themselves, but they're happy to have one of their, uh, one of their colleagues prescribe cannabis who may have more knowledge or understanding or, or a greater level of comfort with working with medical cannabis. So yeah, I do recommend that you look for a BC-based physician, and if you are if you haven't found one in your area yet, please do reach out to Tilray at 844-TILRAY1, or that's 844-845-7291, and we'd be happy to provide um, uh, the name of a physician or organization you can contact somewhere near you. Wonderful. We are uh, just running out of time now, so Philippe, I want to thank you so, so much for bringing such valuable information to our many people who have dialed into this webinar. And to thank all of you who have dialed in, there's 53 of you that my list says have joined this webinar to find out and have your questions answered and to get information about this, this possible option that would be helpful in pain management and other diseases as well. So uh, again, you can send more questions in to Philippe and call uh, Tilray. Well, I, thank you so much. Uh, my, my, my thanks to you, Heather, for making this possible, to Dick and all the folks in uh, People in Pain um, for setting this up, and of course to everyone who uh, took the time out of their Monday to, uh, to join us today, and I, I look forward to answering any follow-up questions you may have, uh, as does uh, the staff here at Tilray. Thanks again. Thank you, and good goodbye, everyone. Have a good day.